Hey, everybody, it's Mark. Thanks for joining me today. With me on today's episode of the Mark My Words pod and vlogcast is Grant Farnsworth. I've had Grant on before a number of times. I discovered their work right at the time that the pandemic began, which is about a year ago now. I discovered some work that they were doing on what they were calling the COVID tracker. The Farnsworth Group is a market research group that works specifically in the home improvement and the building product segment. And so they jumped in and they they started providing, as soon as the pandemic broke, they started providing information to dealers, manufacturers. They were doing this for free, just providing information on what changes were coming to consumers' behavior, whether that consumer was the DIY consumer or whether that consumer was the uh, professional uh, paint user. And as you hear when Grant speaks later, not just painters, when it comes to professional consumers, they were looking at all categories of professional services, not just painting. Uh, but of course, that includes uh, painting as well. And I I love having Grant on because first off, if you've followed my podcasts and my blogging for a number of years, you know, I love data right? I don't like guesses. I love data. I like making decisions that have already previously been informed with what I believe to be the facts of the circumstances. It makes for better decisions and makes for better outcomes. And so one of the things that Grant's company always does is is provide fabulous data. And so I, I love having him on for that. And, you know, I always feel like I learned so much because even though we're all looking at this industry together, we're all looking at it from a very similar perspective. We have one or two perspectives, the people I speak to, maybe three, they're dealers, they're manufacturers, maybe they're distributors. There's a few other uh, experiences that exist in our channel, but that's really it. That's our point of view. And even I have a tendency to look at the industry very much as a dealer would just the bias of, of being a dealer for so many years. But but Grant has a really different perspective. He's not a manufacturer. He's not a dealer. He's not even a consumer, really, of the products that we sell, other than the few gallons he might use for his own home every now and again. And so his insights are really valuable to me because they're really just uh, driven by the data. And so I had noticed that uh, uh, as the pandemic sort of uh, stretched on, they had stopped updating their data on a weekly basis. And so I'd sort of fallen out of touch with with some of the data collecting that they were doing. And then recently I've noticed uh, that they've started putting it out again on a more regular basis. And so I reached out to Grant, see if he would come on and, and share with us what exactly he's seeing in the marketplace. Uh, what exactly are the consumer behaviors, whether it is a DIY consumer or a professional consumer, what are the consumer behaviors that have changed uh, because of this pandemic? And what is the data showing him is going to be the permanent impacts of those changes versus just accommodations we all made during an unusual time in our lives. And so Grant has some really cool insights that I don't think we get uh, from listening to other people in the industry. And so I reached out to him and asked him if he would come on and update you guys. And he agreed. So uh, here he is. I, I hope you enjoy it. I always feel like I learn a lot with Grant. And so uh, like and subscribe, text me, email me, and let me know what you think of the work that I'm doing. I always appreciate the feedback. And I, I hope you enjoy this episode with Grant Farnsworth. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining me today. With me today is Grant Farnsworth. Grant is from the Farnsworth Group. They are a market research group that specializes in the building products and home improvement section in Indianapolis, Indiana. Indianapolis, Indiana, is that right? That's it. I got it. Imagine that. Grant Farnsworth from the Farnsworth Group. How are you? I am well. It's good to see you. How you been? I'm good, thanks. As we sort of joked about before we got on, once you sort of leave the tri-state area, I'm, I'm not as confident in my American geography, apparently, as I ought to be. It's I'll tell you, Mark, there are cities and states and regions between <laughs> L.A. and New York. It's amazing. 
I figure there must be because I have some family in Los Angeles and I fly over the middle of the country pretty <laughs> regularly to go see them. I got to figure there's something in the middle That's there. Right. Yep, yep. So thanks so much for joining me today. You and I hooked up. It was about one year ago yeah. that you and I hooked up. I had noticed, I guess, on uh, perhaps your LinkedIn or maybe I'm on one of your lists that you guys were doing what I thought and still think is some really exceptional work related to the COVID tracker for our industry. So why don't you give us, just as a reminder, I haven't had John in a while, Why don't you give us a a little reminder of what it is that you guys are doing, and then we'll get into uh, some sort of discussion on on how is it going? What is the data telling you now? Yeah, absolutely. So we partnered last year with the Home Improvement Research Institute. So they are a member-driven nonprofit that delivers effectively secondary data for their membership in the home improvement industry. So we, we, we partnered with HERI to start a tracker that looks at DIYers and looks at contractors and their home improvement project activities. How often are they engaging? What are they engaging in? What are the impacts really of COVID, either starting or stopping projects, et cetera? So we did that last year from March, I think through September, somewhere thereabouts. Um, and given some of the changes that we've seen over the last uh, you know, couple of months, um, with COVID, you know, vaccines coming out, um, you know, markets starting to open up. We thought it was a really, really good time to resume this tracker, not only to see what has changed, um, you know, January, February, as COVID is still evolving, but to start doing some year-over-year comparisons. So, Mark, um, you know, starting this month, we're going to have some actual data that we can compare uh, March 2020 to March yeah. 2021 to, to to really see yeah. you know, from the beginning of the pandemic to you know now. What has changed? Both again with, with DIY. I mean, we're talking to over you know you know two three thousand DIYers and contractors um, each and every month on these series of questions. So it's it's pretty exciting. So you guys put this out for the first uh, three quarters of the year, right? And then did you you passed on one quarter, and now you're updating the whole year? Now is that what's going on? Yeah, pretty much. So when we started right. off, when COVID came on, you know, we started mid March and it was every week. I mean, we were yeah. hitting thousands every single week. We then when you and I were speaking more frequently back then That's as right. well, because the data was was changing so frequently. Back we, then. we needed to know what was going on, and th- this is all free um, to the industry. So if you go to the right. you can get access to all of this data. This is about informing our industry, informing our colleagues about what's going on. So we started off on a weekly basis because I don't think anyone knew what to expect. Right. We then moved into a monthly cadence, and that's where we are today. So starting January, we, we are now doing it on a monthly basis. We'll be continuing this again this year through, I would say, at least May, um, possibly June, July, uh, subject to what the results look like. And so you are looking at the industry from two perspectives. You're looking at the effect on the DIY consumer and the effect on the professional consumer. And I want to give you the opportunity to give the little caveat on the professional consumer, because you're covering a little more ground than just the paint industry, right? Correct. Right. So So when you're talking about professional to this group, I want to be clear, because for the most part, my listeners are people in the paint business. When you're talking about the professional group, what is it that you are uh, gathering information from? Who is that group? Yeah. So it's comprised of a, a few different segments. First and foremost is the remodeler section. So kind of a remodeler GC, a generalist, you know, sometimes doing larger projects, whole home remodels, um, et cetera. We're looking at finish specialists. So carpenters, uh, folks yep. like that. Uh, we're looking at mechanicals. So uh, electricians, plumbers, HVAC. Uh, we're looking at exterior contractors. So siding, windows, roofing. And we're also looking at landscape and outdoor contractors. So decking professionals, uh, lawn and garden professionals, et cetera. And in that description, I heard plenty of places where you would have painters in there as well, correct? That finished group. Yep. So that right, finished that finish group. The interior finishes. Um, we've got, you know, flooring folks, painters, you know, drywallers, that type of group. So, you know, we can right. look at it in segments by, by, by trade group, but, you know, don't have large enough sample sizes that we can isolate painters per se to, you know, right. to t- here's what painters are doing versus an electrician. Right. And so why don't you summarize for us sort of the experience that, COVID has brought the changes that COVID has brought to the shopping experience for the DIY and the professional that you guys have discovered. And then let's try to drill down a little bit closer to today's date on on what you're seeing in the market right now. 
Sure. So we do have some questions on channel activity um, for this tracker. We ask, you know, both the consumers as well as the pros, they, they had to have purchased products. So, you know, where did you purchase it in the last few weeks? And, right. you know, we're capturing. So everybody that you're talking to is somebody that has engaged in the channel in some way. They bought something. That's how they got on your list, right? Correct. Correct. Okay, you gotcha. Got you got so, you know, some level of DIYer, um, there, you know, some level of trade, et cetera. And so when we asked, well, you know, where did you buy, you know, home improvement or building products, lawn garden products over the last you know, few weeks, you know, we're capturing again, broad stroke, Right. You get what you pay for, right? It's free. So right, it's free. <laughs> um, but we're at least capturing kind of high level. Were you going in store? Were you buying online, having it delivered? Were you buying online, picking up in store? And what we saw really quick out of the gate last year is a massive shift to digital. Yeah. Online behaviors, right? Yeah. I don't think any surprise there, particularly on the pro side, where you had a lot of specialty suppliers that were closed because they weren't essential. Yep. So we saw a lot of online activity when we think about channel purchases. What we have seen is certainly in-store come back for both the consumer as well as the pro. The really interesting piece, and we get asked this a lot by our colleagues and our clients is, you know, hey, Farnsworth Group, what of these COVID behaviors that have been accelerated, what's going to stick? Right. And so this online discussion, Mark, is, is so constant of, is it really going to stay? And so far, the data is saying Yes. Well, thank God, by the way, because I've invested a tremendous amount of time and effort. I, you don't even know this, but I'm building a, uh, a, a business to uh, create websites for independent paint retailers. You didn't know that, obviously, when you said that. But yeah, online is here to stay, Grant. Online is here. To, now, look, it, it's going to vary by product. It's going to vary yep. by product category, by price points. Yep. So there, there are some nuances when we think about higher price points, you know, uh, um, fashion goods, you know, finished plumbing, finished electrical, et cetera. There may be more opportunity for online because there's options, et cetera. Um, as we think about more commodity oriented products, fasteners, um, sealants, et cetera, you know, maybe less opportunity because there are more immediate needs that they, they go in right. store. But this overall increase of online behavior, we've seen it across, we're tracking roughly 20 ca product categories and it's gone up for all categories and we are seeing it stick. And I think there's a number of reasons for that. And a lot of it is around customer experience. I mean, this accelerated behaviors that were already there online didn't just show up when COVID showed up. Of right? course not. It was small and it was growing. We've seen in some categories 10 to 15 years of online growth in a matter of months. Right. That was because of COVID. That was because of COVID. So it's an accelerant. Right. We talk a lot about this. So right. even if, whether it's you know grocery online purchases, whether it's telehealth, um, whatever the case may be. A lot of these things already existed in the world. COVID accelerated it. We're, we're no different in our industry. Right. Um, it is sticking. So we are seeing online purchase engagements, purchase behaviors remaining fairly stable, um, even though in-stores come back. So you know, a right. little bit of a mix of, of, of doing both. Hey, with the pros, what's really interesting is the larger the firm, the more engaged they became with online purchase behaviors. And that was probably because those firms have an office in place that can set themselves up as a proper customer of a, a you know of a store or a chain of stores that provides good online access versus uh, somebody who's I'm thinking like a you know a pot and brush painter somebody who's working him or her with three or four uh, mechanics working on the job with them they're they're working off of their phone. Right. And they're probably having a little different experience, but that customer is interacting with websites as well, though perhaps not using them to purchase. And that's one of the things that I'm seeing a lot of in other yeah. research that I've seen, not just the stuff that, that I've been following from you guys, is that even the sales that are coming back to the store, and I agree, foot traffic is is... Uh, back, at least as far as paint stores are concerned, it's primarily come back. But the customers that are coming in on foot that are buying paint have been to the uh, website first. So that's exactly it. Yeah, we've got other research and, and a lot of research we do for our clients. You know, we, we do a lot of usage and attitude research. We do a lot of brand health and, and product development, market sizing. So, you know, we understand the full spectrum of, of behaviors for both consumers right. and pros. And without a doubt, their online reference for research in some product categories is three or four times the amount of work that they would spend in a store doing that's right. research. That's so, right. 
And that's across the board, size, trade type, you know, category, et cetera. I mean, so, so online is, is always a component we see uh, almost always in, in path to purchase research, regardless of category. And, and I think you're right, Mark. I mean, the level of sophistication for the larger firms is, is a lot greater and has been. Right. Really, and they can commit somebody, they can commit somebody to the task, which is an advantage. And invest in systems and programs. What's right. interesting, though, is to keep watch on the investments being made by suppliers. So Depot and Lowe's were ahead of this curve. You know, Depot's already committed, you know, you know billions of dollars to logistics and, and some of their infrastructure and, and deliveries and all that good stuff. Lowe's is committing same thing to, you know, several, several, you know, docks and, and locations. And we're starting to see this as well with uh, trade specific suppliers, wholesalers, dealers, distributors, where they're more investing into platforms that help engage with the smaller trades in a simple, easy, efficient manner, reducing that friction. So right. writing is now clear on the wall that even those you know, smaller, less sophisticated trades are game for using these tools and the supplier that can deliver is a that's supplier right. that's going to get an edge. So we are seeing a lot of investment on the supplier side of things um, to, to, to participate in this type of conversation to provide these tools to help these folks, um, you know, be more virtual and remote because they have found that when they can get those systems, it's they efficient. use them. It's they use them. It's efficient. And and you know, just for anybody listening, Grant, you'll you'll back me up on this. You and I did not set this call up at <laughs> all, right? We didn't. We we winged it be, because I said to you early on, I've done enough of these with you. I'm I'm comfortable yeah. doing it. I didn't ask you to say that, but. But you're talking to the to the paint and the sundry manufacturers that I've been talking to for the last several months. They must step into this space and they must create platforms for their dealers. If they leave it to the disparate groups to do their own thing, the dealers are going to have their websites. They're going to get it done, yeah. but it's going to be far too disparate for the manufacturers to take advantage of it. Right. And, and it's not just about purchasing either, particularly That's right now. Right. We see one of the biggest drivers of channel and supplier decision and, and, and overall decision with, with pros being availability. Um, this logistics piece is a huge conversation. All the conversations we have with manufacturers involves some, some type of discussion around availability and logistics. So it's not just- And lately problems. it's worse in coatings. It's much worse since the storms in Texas. And, 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 and lumber, I mean, the, you know, sticks. And I mean, so- We've seen prices of goods, you know, go up dramatically because of the discussion. So a lot of it is not just being able to make the purchase, being able to make the transaction, but it's it's a communication tool. It's about availability and stock. It's about tracking purchases. When am I going to get this? Um, yep. It's about transparency and pricing. So it is now a tool that is almost a necessity for manufacturers and suppliers if they want to earn business, maintain loyalty, et cetera, because it's a it's a, it's a way that we can deliver attributes and tools much more than placing an order. Right. And it's, listen, every consumer wants some sort of experience uh, when they buy what they're buying, right? Uh, they, they need to have their needs met. So if you're having this conversation about paint, obviously you need to be able to do the basics. We need to be able to specify a color, specify a finish and buy a can online. But there's more to it than that. It's the whole experience, how these customers are integrated with your stores, how they're connected with your stores, how you keep them connected through uh, your purchases, through programs that you know reward customers for regular purchases or whatever. The websites are, are now an enormous part of this. That cannot be denied, right? It's, yeah. it's here now. It's, it's, it's another vehicle to provide service. And particularly when you think about right. paint dealers, Service has always been a cornerstone of what paint dealers, lumber yards, I mean, what those specialty suppliers deliver. Another vehicle to allow them to do that when you think about apps or mobile, et cetera. So I can chat, I can text, I can just hit up my rep really quick when I'm on a job site and they can respond immediately in a format that is comfortable for me. That's I want right. support and I want that service when I want it. And now I want it how I want it. I don't want to have right. to run into the store when I have a question. 
So again, people this is today the, don't want to pick up the phone anymore. They would rather text. Right. So the, 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 these behaviors have all been accelerated. And, and I think we've all learned across, you know, whether again, we're buying groceries or doing a virtual doctor's visit, we've all learned that, oh my gosh, this is, there's some upside to this stuff. Yes. This, is, this is pretty convenient. Um, I don't right. want to let go of this. And, and, and pros are no different. DIYers are no different. We've learned some really cool things. And so therefore those suppliers, those manufacturers that are now doing it well, I might gravitate towards those folks. And so why don't you share with me a little bit about sort of what you learned about the DIY consumer, uh, because that was an enormous change at the beginning of the pandemic, yeah. sort of what you've learned and, and tell us where we're at now with them. And then I'd love to do the same thing with the professional user and, 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 yeah. and we'll, we'll wrap it up. Yeah, what I can tell you is the DIY activity is remaining strong, Mark. I think yeah. we're all waiting for that shoe to drop. And yeah. while the forecast for the industry on the DIY, the consumer side is relatively flat, it's flat over a 2020 that was massive for that group. Massive, right. Massive. So we right. may not be seeing gains this year, but don't take that as a negative because we're maintaining all those gains that we saw from 2020. And, and that looks to be the case. The percentages of DIY activity participation that we're seeing in January and February mirror what we saw or even a little bit higher than what we saw um, early last year. And these, this is the slow time for DIY projects. So a lot of positive uh, indicators right now. We have a metric as well that is um, project intent. Project intent remains strong. So that's oftentimes a leading indicator of realized project activity. What is going to be interesting though, Mark, is, is a lot of this has been driven by a shift in disposable income. Mm -hmm. COVID actually served as a catalyst for DIYers to start projects that otherwise they would not have done. We are seeing COVID become less and less of a driver as the reason of why I'm doing a project. So as we start seeing COVID uh, become less of a driver, as we at, at some point anticipate a shift in disposable income going back to restaurants, entertainment, restaurants, travel, entertainment, yeah. does that dollar, does that intent go away? And therefore some of these smaller DIY projects that really were a boom in 2020, at what point are they going to start going away? We're anticipating that, we're expecting that, but we're still waiting for it to translate into actual retail sales and activity. It hasn't happened yet. You know, we're expecting, you know, maybe in the summertime, maybe. Um, yeah. But I think a lot of a lot of it has to be you know, vaccine rollout and, 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 and. Um, and in that case, we may see a, a real big jump in some contractor activity as we think about larger projects and, and some things that were put on the back burner for the last couple of years. One of the things that's interesting to me, you, you know, uh, I think like the rest of America, when the pandemic hit uh, and I was forced to work from home, if you recall, I was working in New Jersey at the time yeah. for uh, Benjamin Moore and I started to work from home. And the, the first thing you do is, OK, I, I need a few new things on my desk. If I'm going to be here every day for the next couple of months, you know, right. I, I want to maybe get a new chair, spend a couple of bucks. But now I, I look around my office now. And, and frankly, now that it's clear, I'm, I'm here forever. This is my life. I've spent a lot of money yeah. to make this room comfortable. And, and I am not the only one in right. that circumstance. I went from a position where it was some company's responsibility to keep me comfortable during the day to where it's mine in my own office, in my own home. You know, I, somebody had to invest to make that happen. And I think right. that's driving some of this business. People are not going back to their offices so fast. It's driving a huge amount. And so what we anticipate seeing, Mark, you've, you've, you've hit on a few things there. The housing supply is really, really low. Yeah. So people are now looking at home saying, well, I've done all the little things that I can do myself that I'm comfortable with. And, and maybe that's just, you know, retrofitting an office and doing some paints. Um, right. You know, maybe it's, 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 you know, reformatting a room to, to become an office or a play space. Maybe I've added a deck outside because I, I need some outdoor living because we're always home now. Um, but it also starts speaking to people with this low housing inventory, really high equity and equity is going to continue to go up for the foreseeable future. Yep. We expect inventories remain low because we can't build enough to meet this high, high demand. People are going to say, well, there's no houses around me to purchase. I've got great equity in my house. I've done all the things I can do. Oh, Time to bring in the big more. Ones. Right. I'll do more. 
I'll do more and I'm going to hire somebody to do it because I now yeah. feel comfortable having them in my home. So yeah. let's blow out the back of the house. Let's remodel the entire basement so we can have two offices down there. So we right. anticipate that the shift of activity is going to migrate more towards larger projects. And therefore the contractor business is really going to be strong this year and likely for the next two or three. And we're starting to see that in the contractor data of our COVID tracker. Interesting. We're starting to see better close rates. We're starting to see more contractors experience uh, larger projects than they had experienced pre-COVID. And a lot of that, again, I think is due to you know, homeowners saying, I- I've done what I can do. I've-, I've-, I've got some equity in my home. Money's cheap right now. Rates are extremely low. Let's do that project. Um, so I yeah. think there's some real exciting things on the contract. A lot of great uh, sentiment on the contractor side um, as we're coming into this year and as we expect for the next you know, two or three. And it sounds to me, so then put them together and, and you guys are bullish on, on independent paint stores in, in general, or I should say specifically, and in general, it sounds like you're bullish on this space. We're bullish on the space, both new housing as well as uh, remodeling an existing home space. And again, I think a lot of it relies on some fundamentals for our industry. We have very, very high demand. We had high demand pre-COVID with yes. underserved communities. We had underbuilt uh, affordable homes. Um, we've got, um, high, uh, home values, which, which translates to equity. We've got low rates. We've got strong, um, you know, population and demographics, uh, behind all of this that would support ongoing demand. Um, we now have a shift in how people view the home that is going to change what they want in the home. Um, a focus on some health and well being, HVAC systems, a focus on some office space and how they utilize the home, outdoor space, all that great stuff. Paint goes on all of that. All of it, yeah. Paint goes on all of that. Yeah. So we're very, very bullish on new housing starts. We're very, very bullish on uh, remodeling project activity. Um, we see it continuing at least for the next two or three years, barring you know some unforeseen you know global you know economic right. or kind of social disaster. But Event, all right. of the pieces, all of the fundamentals are there, Mark, for a very, very strong market uh, for the next few years, without a doubt. Well, it. It's not exactly making me sorry that I sold my two stores in New York City in October of 2019, but I am definitely happy for the friends that uh, I left behind in the industry. Uh, it yeah. sounds to me like they're in for a, a couple of good years. And, and so then uh, just to wrap it up, I know recently there's been one significant change. I don't even know if, if you guys track this at all, but the storms in Texas have had a, a significant impact. Uh, on our business. Most of the manufacturers are receiving uh, primarily resins, but resins and other chemicals on an allocation basis where they may be only receiving 50% of, of what it is that their demand would require otherwise that they sure. get. Have you, have you seen any of that make it in? I know that's fresh. That's only three weeks you know, what we've seen are, are, you know, similar stories and tales. So when we look at um, uh, freights and shipments of, you know, anything that is, is outside of the U.S. So we work with a lot of manufacturers across most product, uh, you know, categories that are, you know, bringing in components uh, from overseas. Yeah. So we've seen, you know, implications, you know, there as well in, in causing a lot of delays. Um, you know, you know, some, some Canadian uh, shipments of lumber coming down. Um, so, I mean, I, I think we, we, this is an industry that oftentimes experiences, um, some delays due to weather and other circumstances. And I think right now we, it's, it's just being compounded with, you know, some delays in, in the manufacturing side, in the international shipment side, um, you yeah. know, still some, 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 some pricing and, and tariffs and, and all that stuff going on. And now we've got natural right. disasters. So um, it's not something that we haven't seen before. Um, it, it translates into prolonged uh, delivery times, lead yeah. times. And again, I think this is where, you know, we're being hired fast and furiously by our clients. Again, we do a lot of customer UNA and understanding um, what's driving their product decisions, what's driving their supplier decisions. Um, so our clients can make strategic choices on how to address what's most important today for the customer, be it a DIY or be it a consumer, because what was important two years ago, what was driving their decision two years ago is totally Could be different. Better. Yeah, it's gone. <laughs> and so, so, you know, we really help our clients dig deep and understand the behaviors of the customer, why they're doing what they're doing so that they can re, you know, shift their communications, their marketing, their, their, their product assortment, whatever the case may be. And, 
And I think right now, a lot of it is, is around communications. How are we, we know we're going to be two weeks behind. Right. That may be okay. How do we address that? What's important to the customer? How, how, yeah. how can we you know, meet, their, meet their other needs? What are those other needs, et cetera? So that's what we've really got to understand in these times when we see these delays. You know, it's interesting. Uh, I get, a, you know, I speak to a lot of paint manufacturers and just manufacturers in this space. Yeah. And, you know, often it will come up a problem associated with a shortage or some sort of other maybe crisis that has affected, uh, you know, how they're handling their customers or what yeah. their customers' expectations on are. And I always tell them the same thing. This starts you're not coming to me with the logistical problem. You're going to figure that out yourself. I don't know anything about buying raw materials, but you're going to start by communicating with your customers what's going on, because that's the only thing that will get you through this. Yep. And, and I'm encouraging dealers to be communicating with their DIY and their professional customers the same way I'm encouraging the manufacturers that I work with to yep. uh, communicate with their uh, dealer customers on exactly Absolutely. what's going on in the market right now, because frankly, I don't think two or three weeks delay is, is going to be enough. I think some products yeah. it's possible you'll be out for the whole season. And oh, so boy. if you don't share that with a customer, yeah, you're, you're going to have a problem. Absolutely. Well, this was a really great, I love, you're absolutely, this is true. And you can listen to all my podcasts. I've never said this to anybody else. You're my favorite guest <laughs> because I feel like I'm learning something. It's not because you're so interesting, by the way, you're very boring in that respect. So don't let your head get big, but I feel like I'm learning something from you rather than just engaging oh, in an interesting conversation. So Grant, I really appreciate your time always. That, that's kind of you to say it's a team effort. Listen, we, you know, we've been studying the building products, home improvement space and lawn and garden for 30 years. Our firm and our people are passionate about it. Uh, we love digging deep for clients to, to help them understand more about their brand and the product and, and their customer. And uh, we're just honored to be able to work with these folks. And, and, and if we've ever got opportunities to share some insights to help their business, um, we're always excited to do it. So thanks for the kind words. Uh, yeah. Still a lot of work ahead of us, but uh, we're, we're always happy to have these discussions. So, so thank you, Mark. Well, I appreciate it. So Grant Farnsworth of the Farnsworth Group. Uh, market research firm in Indianapolis, Indiana. Thank you so much for joining me today. I appreciate it very much. Thanks for the time.